I did naught to six and a half in four years. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I said, no, that's not good at all. I said, but even at six and a half, the question is, why not 20? Why not 50? Why not 100? Because mm -hmm. the only thing stopping you from doing that is, is cash and people. Mm -hmm. So in any business, it's about planning and it's about people. And you'll often find the entrepreneurs have got glass ceilings because they think as an entrepreneur does. But once it gets big enough, it's not actually a glass ceiling in terms of ability. It's actually an interest, actually. So everybody's got one. Some, some are different to others. I won't say higher or lower because that's not true yeah. because you're a perfectly good business can exist at half a million, million pound turnover. And people say, why don't you grow it? Well, you don't need to grow it. You don't need to grow a business. Mm -hmm. But not growing a business does not mean you say you failed. Welcome to Millionaire Secrets, the podcast where we dive deep into the minds of millionaires and entrepreneurs living their version of success, so you can get there too. This podcast was born from my own personal obsession with learning from successful people, and I have traveled the world in order to put myself in a room with the best of the best, millionaire and billionaire entrepreneurs, celebrities with massive influence, and icons who are changing the world with their message. My name is Bethan Jepson. I'm an award-winning entrepreneur and I'm on an absolute mission to make wealth, success, influence and change accessible to everyone who is willing to do what it takes to earn it. Get ready for some amazing interviews where we reveal some epic and unheard of millionaire business and lifestyle secrets. I'm on a personal journey of seeking my own version of business success, but without sacrificing my happiness. If you believe in the success without sacrifice ethos too, then I invite you to join the free Success Circle Network community where we collaborate, problem solve and support each other. You can get all the information via my website at bethanjepson.com. Welcome to episode nine of season two of the Millionaire Secrets podcast. Philip Webb is the founder and MD of Investors in Community which is a digital SaaS platform built using blockchain technology that enables businesses and individuals to donate, volunteer, and gift to charity and community initiatives that matter to them. It provides access to many good causes, empowering the donor and their friends. And from a business perspective, it gives the power to measure, report on, and deliver positive marketing messages to a business's team and customers. Philip built his first business to 6.4 million in four years and was mentored by one of business management's finest minds and creator of the SWOT analysis, Albert Humphrey. Together, Philip and Albert Humphrey turned around and grew dozens, if not hundreds of businesses using Albert's signature change management methodology, which he left to Philip to continue his legacy when he passed away. Philip has since turned Albert's life's work into a book, Leading Constant Change, and continues to pass on Albert's wisdom and legacy by still teaching their methods to a few lucky clients, as well as mentoring me, teaching me how to apply their team action management system in the new businesses that I'm acquiring. I've loved getting to know Philip over the past couple of months, and I'm so thrilled to share this amazing and generous man's insight with you all. Enjoy this episode. Okay, welcome, Philip, to Millionaire Secrets. Thank you very much. Nice, nice to be here. So, yeah, so if you're happy, um, I'm just going to dive in and start asking our deep dive questions. Go ahead. Okay. So, Philip, um, where do you live? I live in Chesterfield, uh, middle of the country. Uh, it's the place with a crooked spire, for anybody that knows it. It's just south of Sheffield. <laughs> absolutely uh yeah my grandparents live in Chesterfield so I'm very familiar with the Crooked Spire I think actually back in the day they took us up it but I don't think you're allowed to do that anymore <laughs> <laughs> um where did you grow up oh that's a leading question um I've no idea where I grew up I'm not quite sure what age I grew up either it's, it's a relative concept to me I was born um, over in Lancashire, but I, I try and keep that a secret so you can edit this one out later on. Um, <laughs> and then I moved with my family, obviously, into, into the borders of Wales up to West Yorkshire. It was what I call my formative years from 12 to 18. And then uh, my father got relocated to London and I was uh, hoisted away from all my friends that too much of mine had just disgust and, and upset at the time and uh, found myself in uh, Buckinghamshire uh, for about a year. 
uh, before I joined IBM, which was my first real job. Mm. And uh, I got this lovely letter saying we lived in Charlfont St. Peter and the, the letter said it's in lovely job. It's in Brentford, just up the road. I thought, fantastic. Stay living at home, have my clothes washed and all that. And, um, and I thought, it's brilliant. So I accepted the job. It's a fantastic job anyway. And then the second person I showed the offer letter to said, actually, Phil, it doesn't say Brentford. It says Brent Wood. <laughs> right, so where the hell's Brent Wood? So that's how I accidentally actually left home at 19 and went to uh, Essex for a few years, Bedfordshire for a few more years. And I settled in Derbyshire around 1990. And so I guess that's where I've sort of grown my businesses and, and grown up, if you like, in, the, in that, those years that, uh, that followed. I love that. Such a great answer as well. Like, well, I suppose you answered it with a question, like, when do we really grow up? <laughs> I mean, little, little, little saying said, don't grow up, it's a trap. But uh... <laughs> Oh, funny. Well, it was actually, my next question was actually, what was your first job and what did it teach you? So you've already told us that IBM was your first job. Uh, did you have any jobs before that? I, I did, actually. I, I worked for an electrical design contractor where I designed the lighting that went into the large buildings. So Wix stores in North London was all my lighting design and uh, electrical installation design. I was there for about a year and a half. Oh, wow. But, uh, and then joined IBM as an engineer. So I was a technical guy and uh, working on machines that you've probably not seen for a long time and maybe have not have heard of if you're going to be cruel to me. And they were the golf ball typewriters. <laughs> and, uh, some of your listeners may hear them some might say what's a typewriter but uh, that's how I started my life and then worked my way through very quickly actually through to international support specialist on uh, mid-range machines and, and latterly on mainframes the big IBM mainframes the ones that drove large companies of, uh, of, the, of the corporate world mm. um, very very interesting career I was top of my game in 1988-89 um, technical specialist on a number of products and then got fed up of being number 96079 so I decided to leave and do something really foolish called starting my own business <laughs> with the disapproval of my family at the time and said why are you leaving such a great company and mm -hmm. uh, but it was a natural thing for me to do it was, it's been burning inside me for years and uh, I'd played around with entrepreneurial activities and buying and selling stuff from China and things like that and it was now time to legitimize my my entrepreneur within I suppose so that's what happened in 1990. Amazing. And going back to like your very early, um, early days starting out in, in whatever job, um, you, well, whether it was the electrical, electrical engineer design one or, or IBM, what was kind of one of the early lessons you learned from the workplace, which you've kind of taken with you and, and, and has been impactful? I, I built up a picture when I first started work. If I'm going to do something, be the best you possibly can. Um, if you're going to do anything in life, be as good as you can, be better than most if you can achieve that, because that's where your vocation, your passion lies. Um, I couldn't just be a cog in a wheel. It drove me mad. Um, so therefore, I had to be better and I had to try and improve myself. And the only way of doing that for me was outside of the corporate world in, in small businesses and learning from scratch really what on earth is a business how does it work what's finance all about um how do you sell how do you set up processes and it's this whole passion for learning which was in, in me and has been developing and has never stopped you never stop learning and, and never never lose the passion for learning i think is one of the things that was pretty much embryonic in me at the time so mm, yeah, i love that did you have a role model or a mentor that has inspired you or created impact in your life or business? And if so, who was that? I've got two, actually. The first one is the obvious one. It's my father. Um, he was an incredible guy. He started off a door-to-door -door salesman, ended up an international director of a very, very large firm. And he actually did things to change marketplaces. Mm -hmm. um, and I won't go into it all now. We could spend a long time talking about it. But he, was, he set up one of the most successful uh, white goods promotion uh, marketing campaigns ever, uh, never been surpassed since he did it in the 90s. Um, oh. And he's also a bit of an entrepreneur himself. Um, so he was one of the, the key role models, his, his liking for people, precision, relationships, all those combination of factors uh, mm -hmm. was something that I aspired to emulate from a very early age. And he was a big guy in my life. Um, so that's my first uh, role model, if you like. The second one came quite unexpectedly in 1991, just after I set up that first little bedroom start company. And uh, I, was, I was phoned up by an American guy who was living in London 
And he said, young man, he says, I can make you rich. And I said, yeah, OK, thanks a lot. There's no such thing as a get rich quick scheme. So I didn't talk to him and he kept phoning me. And eventually I said, OK, look, we'll meet. And his name was Humph, Albert Humphrey, uh, but Humph to his friends. And, and we met and turned out that he was the man who wrote the SWOT analysis, Strengths, Weaknesses, Opportunities and Threats. And he wrote it in 1966. So he was only in his early 60s when I met him. And uh, he was quite inspirational in the way which he described how businesses work, why they work, change management. He taught me finance. Um, so he, he gave me a lot of knowledge that allowed my first business to grow from a bedroom to six and a half million turnover in four years with mm -hmm. no business experience, apart from learning a lot from Humph and, and other people, of course. But he was a, a great character. He became a family friend to me in the end, passed away in 2005. And uh, such as our relationship, he left me all the research that gave rise to the SWOT analysis and the stakeholder concept. And that exists in boxes in my loft. I'm desperately trying to find a place to put it. Mm -hmm. I keep offering it for free to universities and they all get terribly excited, but don't actually do anything about it. So mm -hmm. for anybody listening who wants to talk about having the origins of SWOT under their control, I'm more than happy to talk to them. It belongs in public domain. Mm -hmm. So he was a great guy and still miss him today. It's a long, long time ago now, but uh, he's, I can still hear his chuckle and his, his American accent and, um, and his, his sage advice, I think, was the thing I miss most. Yeah. Well, I'm going to ask you more about um, your, yeah, both your role models, actually, because, um, yeah, it, they, they've clearly had such a massive influence and impact on your life and business. So we'll be coming back to this. And <laughs> <laughs> um, what was the biggest lesson that you have taken from the pandemic? Oh, goodness. The pandemic was a, an interesting time because my business um, had the ability to operate remotely. And I installed that a month before the lockdown. I could see exactly what was going to happen. I put everything in the cloud. And so we're all happily working from home. Um, so that was interesting. The pressures that, that there were unseen pressures, I think. Uh, mental health, I suppose, is the common term for it these days. But it was the, the feeling of isolation, the feeling of not having that collaboration um, so I set about trying to create as many opportunities as I could with my teams to say, look, let's have a weekly call here. Let's have a catch up call there. Uh, we can't meet physically because of the lockdown restrictions. But um, so we tried to devise strategies to overcome the social isolation. So that was some lessons to be learned on how to deal with people when you're not in front of them. It was mm -hmm. quite interesting. But the second thing I saw in the pandemic was this huge and I mean huge shift of attitudes and markets so going into the pandemic, we had a, the height of capitalism. The, the economy was doing reasonably well, despite the Brexit effect. We were starting to see a future of expansion. And suddenly, bang, it was all gone. Mm -hmm. uh, and everybody suddenly just hunkered down in a way which I've never seen in my lifetime and, and hope to never again. Mm -hmm. I'm sure most, most listeners will agree to that. But ultimately, at the end of the day, people's attitudes change. And the lesson you have to learn coming out of a pandemic, as with any recession, but far more so with the pandemic, is that people are not the same. So even the same customers coming out of the pandemic will not behave, think, desire, want, operate in the same way as they did before. Mm. And the biggest mistake any business can make is expecting it to be so. Because when you stick your head above the parapet and say, everything's back to normal, let's go back to the way it was, well, the way it was is gone. Mm. And if you don't think that, you're gonna be out of business very soon. You've got to adapt and behave as a startup in finding out what your customers are wanting now, what their thoughts, their pressures, their desires, their products, their services, what are they doing? Because if you don't understand that, you've got no chance of establishing that relationship going forward. So you're almost in a position where the businesses that had to furlough and close down during that pandemic have to reinvent themselves substantially. Mm -hmm. And they got all sorts of words. They called it pivoting and all that sort of stuff. But frankly, it's just common sense. You have to reestablish <laughs> that relationship with a customer who's changed. Yeah. changed attitude changed financially changed all sorts of different ways um so open your eyes put your eyes on i'm a motorbiker so put your eyes on full beam is, is the thing see ahead see over the hedges look what's around the corner because otherwise it's going to hit you pretty hard oh that is so true and i'm glad you've um, mentioned that actually um because it was something that what's well, something i've seen a lot it's like because previous to what I'm doing now and I was kind of doing online business consulting uh, during the pandemic and, and for a little bit afterwards um, there was a huge change in online behavior 
um, because people got tired of Zoom basically <laughs> and got tired of being online all the time. Um, so I've seen businesses crumble because the, the campaigns that were working beforehand weren't working after yeah. and they just I suppose just hoped that something would magically <laughs> change and all oh, and yeah and it, it never ended well so it never will but don't you think that's actually the one positive thing you can take for the pandemic is that I believe this is my personal belief others may agree with me that people have changed to the point where they're not afraid to be people instead of automatons or robots in the workplace they can actually express themselves as individuals with some weaknesses we have some mental health pressures we have childcare issues we have and suddenly the personal life has become exposed into the corporate environment mm. i don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing the, the traditionalist in me says oh my goodness can't companies go back to work but actually the the, the the real me says no this is part of our evolution yeah. um, and we have to move with those times we have to accommodate people and all of their issues in the workplace relationship. If you can do that, you've got yourself a really tight-knit workforce, you've got yourself a loyal following, and you've got yourself future success. So people are really, really important. I've always believed that throughout my entire career. Um, but ultimately, I think that's the one positive we can draw from this pandemic is that people have found the confidence to be people. Yeah, wow, I love that. Um, <clears throat> What is um? What's your next big goal? My next big goal, um, I've probably got one in my sights at the moment, and it's called Investors in Community. It's a business, and it's that, that's the business that I'm currently operating. It's an online SaaS platform, software driven, and it knits together two halves of our fragmented society, and it's the charities, the not for profits, the schools, the the people that generate social value in our world as opposed to businesses that create capital value in our world. And putting those two together has always been an ambition of many people, perhaps. And businesses will tell you, well, yes, we give to charity. We allow some volunteering to take place occasionally. Um, for many businesses, it's the conscience gift at the end of the year. We've made this profit. Oh, let's throw a few grand at a charity. Wonder which one it'll be this year. <gasps> this is the one, and off they go. That's, mm -hmm. that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about truly integrating. The way I've just talked about people becoming real again is the way that I want to see the two halves of our society come together. Because, yes, businesses, they're, they're great. They're the only wealth creation mechanism in the world, and everybody else spends the money, so say the capitalists. Um, and you can look at public sector and you think, well, yeah, they just waste money, don't they? Or you look at the, the charitable sector and say, well, here's a few crumbs. But actually, if you actually look at the holistic way in our society forms, I'll, I'll offer you this. At some point in your life, and I hope it'll be for many years in the future, not too soon, everybody watching or listening to this, this particular podcast will become a service user of a charity. Think mm. about that. Now, whether that's to do with mental health, physical health, whether it's to do with loneliness, whether it's to do with end of life, whether it's to do with a disease, a charity is established to provide that extra support that the state cannot provide at the micro level. So think of a charity differently now. They're an enabling mechanism to give quality of life when it's most needed and the state or a business cannot provide it. Yeah. And this is like a cushion, if you like, for our society. And I've got a long-standing belief. My goal is to bring those two halves together, those two hemispheres together, to work and cooperate together to mm -hmm. form a better society in which we live, to level up the playing field and to make it a better world. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Oh. I love that yeah and and I think it's I think it's such a timely mission as well because it goes back to what you were saying before about like people are like a revolving kind of their awareness and their relationship to themselves and feeling yeah like they don't have to put on a mask and equally the same which like technological advancement and I feel like your this business takes like the future of technology the future of like people and them being able to articulate what they really care about and obviously company culture that will bleed into company culture because people make up businesses um so yeah so I think that's yeah I think it's really exciting and well you know that I'm really into it anyway but <laughs> I, love it. I love it so much and uh yeah, I have no doubt that it's going to be very successful. Well, we, we call it social value uh, and everything has a social value. But 
particularly the, the younger generations, the Gen Ys, Gen Zs of this world, that's you know people in their early 20s joining the workforce. Yeah. And they're actually choosing now to take a salary sacrifice in favour of a company that is being seen to be more socially contributable. Yeah. They, actually, the investors are saying, well, if you don't socially contribute, then your lifetime in business is shorter because you're less sustainable because the talent won't come to you. They've gone somewhere else to yeah. get your money. Uh, the customers will judge because they're now judging a, a business or a supplier on their social value credentials. And ultimately, you will find yourself either attracting the talent, the customers and the money to be successful, or you'll find it bleeding away. And so this is where social value is taking centre stage at the moment in my life and certainly in the way I'm talking to my business customers and, and obviously the, the thousands of charities out there that are pretty desperately in need of some help right now. Businesses want to give it. They just don't know quite how or when or how to measure it. And that's where we come in. Yeah, I think it's an interesting time as well for like the environmental charities because obviously like COP26 and press, like businesses will be pressured especially like now I'm in the engineering manufacturing industry, <laughs> like there's pressure to do whatever you can, Yeah, uh, you know, for those environmental causes. So there is, and, and one can sit there and argue the set. If I turn the lights out 10 minutes earlier every day, I save this amount of electricity, my carbon footprint as a business goes down a bit. Does it really matter? Mm. Well, whether it matters or not in the global context of pollution is irrelevant. It's actually what people think of you as a business. Yeah. Um, and what you stand for and where your purpose is as a business if you can establish that and yes all those little habits may make a, a drop in the ocean difference but there's lots of drops in every ocean and mm. if everybody did it it will make an effective difference yeah. but it's more so right now here and now it's about doing the right thing and then being seen to do the right thing and then you will attract the successful factors on your business yes absolutely um <clears throat> What are you finding challenging in your life or business right now? Finding time to sleep at the moment. It's, <laughs> no, it's a, it's a very, very busy time. We are challenged by the fact that social value as, a, as an idea, a concept is accelerating massively. So in January, for example, the government, UK government said 10% of all the awarding marks for tendering to do work for local or national government, 10% of the marks is attributable and reserved for social value statements. That was January. We're now in late later in 2021, so now it's moved. It's no longer 10%, it's more like 30%. Wow. And that's a massive shift. So the markets in which we are operating are moving at a pace. And you just mentioned COP26. I mean, that's another driver for emotive actions. Mm -hmm. And so all around us, the world is changing massively. It was proposed in 2018 that the 2020 to 2030 decade was the, the decade of a thousand years. Yeah. And they suggested in that decade, as much progress will be made as the previous 1000 years before it. And you think, wow, that's that's ridiculous. And how can that happen? And people don't change that quickly. And then along came COVID. Of course, everything is changing. So the challenges are in a changing market that's changing so dynamically, rapidly, is maintaining your, your presence and your business um, factors that make you continue to be in business and ultimately be successful. So the challenge is that the pace and the speed of change in the last six months, forget the last few years, the last six months has been massive. And you've got to keep learning, keep listening, keep reacting positively and, and try and pick your way through to get to the, to the other side of the, of the changes that are happening even now. Mm. So a bit of a follow up question to that then. Um, obviously, you, your business, like we just said, is tied to so many different industries, sectors, causes. <laughs> it's yeah. very reliant on like the market and like what the government like policies are and like, you know, basically everything you just said. How do you, as like one man <laughs> who's steering the ship, how do you keep on top of everything that's going on and making sure that you, yeah, you're, you're, you're you know, you're not one step behind the market you know you're you're moving with the momentum <laughs> of the market <laughs> around you like how do you how do you keep up uh good question i think i mentioned the word lack of sleep at the beginning of this business <laughs> yeah, yeah. but uh it, it's really you've got to keep your informational feeds turned on you've got all the usual suspect platforms that give you new stories and feeds 
but you can't do it. You mentioned one man. I'm just one person in my business. I'm not my business and my business is not me. Mm -hmm. And that's really important because ultimately I've got, you know, people around me in my immediate employed team. I've got another 14, 15 ambassadors behind that that feed information in all the time. Okay. There's a board of directors of five. Um, so again, informational load comes into us. A huge amount, actually. Um, I think the second part of the question is how do you decide what's relevant and how do you get through that tome of information? Because we do have information overload, don't we? Yeah. In any industry, for whatever reason, there's so much information out there, it's unbelievable. Um, but how do you pick out the bits that matter? And I guess to do that, you need to become a strategist. Unfortunately, my Myers-Briggs profile tells me I'm an architect. Yeah. So, and I'm a chess player and I can see things happening in the marketplace and understand how that's possibly going to impact on the here and now. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have one of those in your business or you're not confident, reach out and find one because that's the skill set that's required going forward. It is the architectural skill set. What are we building? How are we how are we compensating for market shifts strategically where we're going? If you don't, you'll find yourself swamped in the doing of the business, the bit that's going on all around you. And you will just find yourself completely swamped by the operations of your business is now critical more than ever before. We've always said it's important, but it's critical. You strategize and you have a strategic head on your shoulders or find the non-exec who can bring that skill set to the table. Mm, yes, absolutely. Um, so what has been one of the best days in your career? What's one of the first things that comes to mind when I say that? Goodness, you're throwing these at me now, Beth. <laughs> <laughs> best days days in my career. I have questions. <laughs> I know. Um, I mean, there's the obvious success points. You know, when I sold my first business, but that wasn't necessarily one of the best days of my life because I was half sad to see it go. Um, there are lots of personal best days, you know, birth of my children, obviously, and things like that. But um, uh, I don't know, really. I think I get most enjoyment from situations where I'm able to see somebody else succeed through my help. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it may sound twee, but it's actually true. I, I would rather promote somebody else's success than be in the limelight myself, to be honest. So mm -hmm. um, that's the, the, the way I go about running my life. Interesting. Okay. Um, all right, then on the other side of the coin, is there a day that stands out as being pretty terrible in, the, uh, in your entrepreneurial journey? Yeah, I was on a um, one of my businesses I contracted to sell uh, on an earnout, and an earnout is where you tie the value of your shares to the end of year, end of next year, end of the following year net profitability. Uh, and earnouts for anybody who's ever been through one is an instant conflict situation because as soon as you sell, your your next tranche of money for the shares you've sold comes at the end of a, a financial period, mm. where net profit is usually the driver. And so the first thing you want to do is protect that net profit. You're still in the business. You're still working it. So yes. you're still there protecting the net profit, potentially winding down resources to promote your net profit so your payout's bigger. Right. But the acquiring business, of course, wants to do the opposite. They want to staff it, resource it, expand it. And yes, the net profit may suffer in that particular period. Mm -hmm. So automatically, you're at loggerheads with the acquirer. And, and I was in that position. And so when the, the call finally came through is, we're not going to make any more payments to you, Phil. Uh, we decided that's it. And I said, well, you're fully contracted, so I will sue you. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was that horrible sinking feeling that I realized, and perhaps I should have realized earlier, a contract is worth nothing. Uh -huh. A contract simply sets out the terms under which you can sue somebody. Mm. and that's it and I was mistakenly naively it's my young, younger years now thinking I've got a contract I've got this protective position that's rubbish mm. a contract simply sets out your conflict resolution when somebody decides I don't care about the contract it's all going away and so I ended up in a period of one and a half years of legal conflict uh, we did win at the end of it but it was hard and mm. it was a very awful process to go through trying to sue somebody in the high court cost a fortune ended up with a fraction of what we should have got if the earnout had been successfully driven. I suppose that was a, a down point in my career, I suppose. Mm, oh, yeah, that sounds horrendous. It sounds like a really terrible divorce. <laughs> it sounds like, yeah. Could... No, I've had a divorce since then. It's not as bad as that. So. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, the ups and downs of life. But uh, well, as you say, you learned some valuable lessons, it sounds like. Um, which I suppose is what we can, that's the only thing we can take from 
Well, you see, I take that learning and give it to my customers and advise them when they're talking about entering into an earnout position. I'll explain the the tussle, the dichotomy of an earnout is that both parties want the business to be successful, but one wants to expand it and one wants to reduce it and make it more profitable potentially. And I just point out the the issues associated with it. So I help clients all the knowledge I've ever got. Um, I'm, a, I'm a bank of issues and, and facts and challenges and opportunities. And I simply convey those to my my customers when I'm advising them as a consultant. Mm -hmm. So they, they get a whole range of knowledge from me, which is uh, unusual and varied and uh, hopefully useful to them. Stop them making the same hiccups as I did. Well, those are the most useful things that it's not the thing. It's not the thing you read in a book or no. you learn on a course. It's the you know it's the stuff that comes from somebody else going through it and yeah it is my, my daughter phoned me up once and she said oh, so I've, so I've dropped my mobile phone in my pint of lager she said and she's upset and she was crying and I said uh, so well that's that's the lesson you've got to learn Sophie and she said well she said, why do these lessons always have to cost so much she said <laughs> <laughs> but it's true unless you actually go through it you can't experience the emotion attached to it and therefore you can read it as much as you like but you never do it <laughs> oh. <laughs> bless her um okay this is a new question that i'm asking so you're a bit of a guinea pig um and you know feel free to think about this for um however long is there a question that you would like to ask my next podcast guest given that you know my guests are all you know successful entrepreneurs or business owners or leaders is there a question that yeah that you would like to know of somebody somebody who's in that position um so a peer you know a colleague anything that comes to mind um it's not so much knowledge I'm always curious when I talk to entrepreneurs that says what drives you to do what you're doing mm. what is your personal drive not, not business nothing to do with money nothing to do with any of that what's your personal driver the thing that niggles inside of you that says why are you doing this what are you bothering? What's it can't just be about money or, or power or accolade. It's got to be something inside of you. And very often people don't know because they don't understand themselves. Mm -hmm. But I'm always interested in the inner self of an individual to say what actually drives you. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's probably a question I would probably ask any of anybody in, in business as an entrepreneur. Amazing. Well, I will ask the question next time and I'll let you know how it goes down. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so this is the, the final question of my deep dive. Um, and this is just something that I like to ask because this is this is true to my kind of ethos and, and values, and this is something that drives me. Um, is this concept called success without sacrifice? And the reason I like to ask uh, a guest what their version of that is, is because everyone has different versions of success and everyone has different versions of sacrifice. So it's always interesting. Um, <laughs> so then, yeah. So what what is your version of success without sacrifice, Phil? Uh, my version of success um, when I was younger was purely money. Yeah. Um, I could afford the material assets I wanted to buy, the big cars, the big houses, and I did, and mm -hmm. it was fine. Um, but I quickly realised uh, in my early thirties, probably, that that didn't actually make me happy at all. Um, so I set about on a quest for what does make you happy and it's nothing to do with material assets and that sounds twee but it's true you can always buy a new car if you want one but does it make you happy yes it does for a little while um, until you know a year down the line when it becomes an old car mm. uh, but you do keep buying new cars every year to make yourself temporarily happy no I don't think so uh, and the size of houses I've owned some very very large houses and then this one's a very modest house because I like it because it's small um or small small enough for, it's big actually but it's small it's small enough for me on my own as it were but um so what you have in life materially speaking is not the driver for happiness i think that has to come through relationships um it has to come through your friends your family your your, your daughters or, or sons or uh, whatever it in your family it has to be about that but it has to be slightly more than that for me it's actually what can i give them Mm. Not materially, not materially, not money wise, but what can I give them in terms of advice or comfort or words of wisdom that will help them to understand the world and become all they want to become? Mm. And I've always had a mantra with my own daughters. I've always said from a very, very early age, I said, always be yourself. Mm. Don't try and be something that somebody else wants you to be in a relationship or work wise, nothing. Be yourself. Find out who you are and be yourself. 
And I think that's the definition of success. If you can be yourself, you are successful. Mm. Ah, amazing. And such a positive message for young women to hear. Um, yeah. Because, yeah, because it's not, it's not always the case that women feel they can be themselves in certain environments. So, yeah, oh, I applaud you for that. I think that's amazing. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so I'd like to revisit um, the role models that you talked about. Um, and obviously, I, you and I have um, sat down and spent a bit of time together before this interview. Um, so I know, I know about kind of Albert and obviously the business that you um, built off the back of his mentoring and with him. Um, I was just curious, actually, like, you know, you tell the story that Albert rang you out of the blue how and how did he know who you are like what about what about you and what you're doing like oh there was there was nothing special about me he he used to um he was an interesting character he was he came across from america in 1971 with the the swot analysis and his his bigger program called team action management and that was a a program that allowed businesses to rapidly change people within teams to a prescribed framework massively successful it's a framework. Anybody can learn it, by the way, um, but it's actually what he brought across. And he went to see WH Smith's Hamilton Press. He went to see Allied Foods in Cadbury's and some very, very big companies. And uh, so he brought that information across to the UK. And he had a very successful time for most of the 70s, 80s and some of the 90s. And um, in doing so, he never actually built a business. Mm. He operated it as himself, um, just on his own he never took a team on yeah. he wrote a little booklet i found in one of his research notes that explored the possibility of making this into a company but he didn't want to do that so he never did he never marketed himself uh in the way that you and i would ever understand and linkedin was around when he was alive but he didn't use that very much a little bit maybe but i taught him how to use it in the early days um he had no formal marketing he used to lift the phone Mm. And he literally used to go down lists of phone numbers and phone chief executives saying, I've got this program that can make you a different company and I can explore. And so he literally did that. But it, the way he got to me was through a friend, an engineer friend of mine working for IBM who was fixing his printer. And, uh, <laughs> and, and he mentioned me as just having set up in business and, and Hub said, oh, I'll, I'll give him a call. And that's what, exactly what happened. He rang me and, wow. uh, he did, and he never gave up. He was always calling people all the time. And uh, he was an amazing guy. Mm. Uh, he could have been, well, he was on stage with people like Deming and people, Charles Handy. He knew them, mm. um, but he never really promoted himself in that way. He was never a public applauding figure that you'd normally expect to see. He didn't write the book. Mm. Um, it, I wrote his book after he died in 2014, Leading Constant Change. And that's Humphrey's work. Mm. But he never wrote his own book, um, which would have been a, a big place for him in the world if he had. Mm -hmm. so um so he was a very private man and uh so nothing really expanded past that point yeah that's interesting because um you mentioned before as well yourself like you don't like to be in the spotlight um and obviously I mean Albert takes that to the extreme <laughs> um well why why do you think you, you can reflect on yourself or reflect on on Albert but um, and the reason I ask you this is because I also feel like that as well. Like I pr much, much, much prefer not being in the spotlight. Um, why, why do you think that's the case for you, Albert, people like me? Why, what is it about the spotlight do you feel isn't enticing or doesn't serve what you want to do? Just curious, really. Yeah, it's a curious question, isn't it? I think... I mean, don't get me wrong, I can stand up in front of, you know, a thousand people, and I have done, uh, giving speeches in various large venues. And that's not the issue. That's not the limelight that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, the limelight is where you become this very well-known, famous figure, I suppose. And I've never pursued that because I didn't think that it was ethically my, my bag, I guess. Um, I'm no better than anybody else. I'm slightly different to a lot of people, which gives me an edge and helps my customers when they work with me and hopefully makes investors and communities successful because it's a combination of things that nobody else could have thought of mm -hmm. potentially, or mm -hmm. perhaps they could. Um, I don't think anybody's any better than anybody else in this world, but we seem to create in our society these, these gurus, these celebrities, and nothing drives me mad quicker 
than watching Love Island or something like that because <laughs> I, don't, I, never, I never watch that stuff. So I think this is all self-promoted people who are out there trying to advocate their way of life as being the best and they're better at other people and they win this competition. And I think, really, you're not serious. This is just, this is nothing. They only exist because people applaud them and like them for what they look like or what they do or the things they say. And I've never pursued that. It's never been in my psyche. Yeah. Um, I will yeah. achieve whatever I achieve even my life but I don't need to be applauded from the rooftops bang adoring nations or anything like that that's not my bag uh, mm -hmm. if I want to do that I go into politics I guess and that's certainly not going to happen so <laughs> yeah I don't blame you um, <laughs> no I have to admit that um I saw recently that I can't remember it's some sort of business event I can't remember exactly what it was yeah. um but they had someone that was on Love Island and that then launched a bikini brand off the back of it was like on the panel mm. and my instant reaction was like oh that's so annoying and do they even deserve to be there but the second yeah. part of me was like well were they just really smart from the beginning and was like well I'll go on Love Island to then promote my bit like to promote this business idea that I've already got and then I was like maybe they're the cleverest person like I'm like entrepreneur <laughs> Like, can I reassure you, Beth, and they're not intelligent people. <laughs> <laughs> Generalising a bit, but uh, generally these people go on there because they look great. Yeah. They're a freak of nature. They look very pretty or very handsome people, and they go on there because people want to be like them. And yeah. I think that's a sad thing, and I think that's probably the underlying bit to the question you've asked me is people want to be somebody else, but actually everybody else is taken. You've just got to be yourself. Mm. And if you can be yourself and people want to follow you that's fine um but i don't seek it um because i think ultimately self-promotion is vanity um and it's not real and i think the world has got enough stuff going on that's not real right now we we're so we're so far removed from the origins of our planets that we have this, this environmental disaster happening around us i mean i can challenge you and say would you know how to make uh, a wheel for a wooden cart would you know how to make one <laughs> because most people say i haven't got a clue sorry yeah. Um, but you know that's a basic concept can you make a wooden wheel and nobody knows how to do it oh mm -hmm. there are a few people but fewer and fewer people and they'll turn around and say I don't know how to make it but I'll google it mm -hmm. and you think it strip away technology and humanity is lost it has no skills no connections with the earth anymore at a meaningful level for 90 percent of the population and I think that's the bit that saddens me a bit it's uh, we're so taken up with technology and leading these fabricated almost um uh, meta universe lives as, as facebook would have us do then no it's not for me perhaps i'm old-fashioned <laughs> well no i mean i don't think you're old-fashioned <laughs> i think that's a very uh i think that's a great insight and uh, yeah it, i think it raises a question when you take yeah when you take away technology what do you have left <laughs> and I think a lot of young people should be asking themselves that because you know yeah yes you can become a YouTube influencer and make money or you can yeah you can go on Love Island and then sell bikinis off the back of it but without those platforms what do you have left mm. is that okay with you like you know the value you offer the world so yes. Yeah, I think that's powerful. It's my it's my definition of the apocalypse is to turn the internet off. Yeah, yeah. Serious, because without that, that nothing, yeah. nothing, nothing, nothing can happen. Yeah, nothing. Uh, food it. supply chains stop working. Clothes, every supplier stops supplying. Yeah. Everything's driven through our technology. Turn that off, and the vast majority of people would would starve. They would suffer. There'll be social chaos, uh, and ultimately, a lot of people will die if you turned off that one thing in our lives and how sad is that that we become so dependent on that well yeah it is um so yeah that's a, <laughs> that's a question i'm, I'm saying i'm Where saying that about and from, from the man who's got an online SaaS platform turning shows <laughs> all over it but, <laughs> please don't turn the internet off <laughs> oh funny <laughs> oh dear okay actually i think this is this will be uh, valuable for people listening um, obviously, you started your career off at IBM, like you said, and you did kind of allude to potentially the decision, like why you made the decision to leave. But I'd be interested to for you to just share kind of your insights and I suppose your experiences of those early days of starting a business, like because I imagine there was 
quite a big shock in a way you've gone from being in this big massive corporation with there's people around you to, and people to delegate to to then being on your own with your own vision your own <laughs> skills is, is the tools of the business um and like you say you obviously were amazingly successful growing to 6.4 million in was it four years yeah that's just insane like that's amazing like what was what was going for your head in the early days to really to really well, to do what you did <laughs> uh, the early days really i mean I, I left when i left and set the business up i had a, a tin desk it was a metal desk i had a fax machine and i had about seven second hand little disk drives out of the computer it's all i had I started off that and I had about £100 in the bank, by the way. Wow. Uh, they were the heady days of, of 12% interest rates on your mortgage. Wow. And I had a big one. So uh, it was a very sort of <clears throat> squeaky, squeaky time, really. Um, and really, there's no choice. There was no going back. Therefore, you had to go forward. It's a burning bridge concept. So I literally sat about, well, let's sell the seven disk drives for a start. I got about £200 for them. My monthly outgoings were about £1,500 at the time in mortgage alone by the way oh. um so that this is a big big thing to do so the first thing i did was get a bank overdraft to see me first the first couple of months and then i started focusing not on the money and it was it was taught to me by a guy called jay abraham actually who's an american marketing guru at the yeah, time I, I, uh, I know jay. yeah yeah i've actually been to uh, some lectures of his in the u.s in la so have you i, <laughs> yeah. I, I bought twelve thousand dollars worth of his stuff once and he shipped it to yeah. me with cassette tapes you listen to and uh, <laughs> i use a lot of jay's stuff in the growth of the business and it was all about don't focus on the money you might want to, you might be screaming at yourself, you've got to make payroll, you've got to make this happen, you've got to cover the bills. But if you focus entirely on the money, you will never have a successful business to the degree that you could have had if you focus on the customer. Yeah. So in the very early days, made up these special Word documents with nice graphics on it and set out the proposal properly and formatted it professionally and, and sent that off to the customer with a brochure, with some explanation of what it would be for them, and entered into the customer's head, would I be pleased if I got this, as mm. opposed to a, a fax one page A4. And so I spent a bit of time cultivating the customer psyche, and I responded to that in a way which under, made me understand how best to position me. And that's really what started to fuel the growth. We went above and beyond just, can you give me a quote for this machine? Yeah, we'll do that. But what do you want to do with it? How do you want to do this? So the paragraph was, you want to do this, you want to reduce productivity, reduce um production of report timings etc cetera, etc cetera. um there was one company that wanted to trial the new 64-bit alpha processors and there was this high speed stuff at the time mm. and i said uh, so basically we put it in there and all of his overtime collapsed because he didn't have to spend all night watching these old machines chunk a chunk a chunk away like this and what he did in nine hours he did in an hour and a half mm. he couldn't he couldn't believe it he ran it again to make sure but it did Mm. And his biggest complaint to me at the time was that uh, he'd, he'd lost all his overtime and the free pizzas they used to get by sitting around late at night in the offices. <laughs> and uh, So you, you learn to engage with the customer at the personal level. And that was the thing that sort of drove me to, to those early days successes. I suppose that's, a, that's an ethos and a strategy, if you like, that you can take into any business. And I imagine you took, it, you took that forward into your other business ventures that you had. Yes. Yeah after that was there anything um was there anything else that uh, you would call maybe your own personal business blueprint which you've applied in each business because it's been successful and you know it works and uh, the secrets of my success well <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the real one is is focus on what you're doing uh, the, the biggest problem a lot of businesses have is they what we call artisan businesses and these are people like myself as an engineer i could have set myself up as an engineering company and all I knew about was engineering. But, and in fact, that's what I did in the early days. I knew about technical stuff, but I didn't know about selling or business. <clears throat> what happened there was I started learning very, very quickly the different facets of a business. So it's learning what actually is needed to position yourself in the market. And the biggest problem a lot of people have is they're slightly better than most when they set their first business up. Yeah. And then things change and they become equal footing to most. And then they become slightly behind the times and they lose their edge. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, you need to be slightly better than most at the first business you ever set up or indeed subsequent businesses, but make sure you're more than that. 
make sure you solve a problem. If you don't solve a problem, and I don't just mean a better mousetrap, I mean a problem. Mm -hmm. Investors and community solves the problem of charities and businesses being fragmented. That's yeah. a real social driving problem. And the government are backing it up with targets and <clears throat> the reporting accountants are looking at how you verify stuff. There is a problem to be solved. Mm -hmm. And the most powerful and most successful businesses solve problems. Now, some of the problems you don't even know you've got. So they're actually identifying a problem and showing you what the problem is before you get it. <clears throat> Did you know it's a problem that you don't get deliveries from Amazon in, in under two hours? But apparently Amazon have decided that is a problem. So they're now doing it in two hours by drone delivery in certain parts of the world. So things move. Problems become problems when you haven't got something or when you have got something. But find out what the problem is. Because mm -hmm. if you're solving the problem and the problem's big enough, sales will happen. Mm -hmm. Success will naturally follow you and indeed accelerate towards you. Mm. Okay. So going back to what you said then about um, some owners or if artisan type owners you know, like you said they're the best at what they do and then they're the same and then they kind of lose their edge obviously at some point in that process there is the opportunity to change or evolve yes. <laughs> but not all businesses do as you said and obviously you having such an amazing experience of change management and the work you did with Albert like why can some businesses change and evolve and why can some not what the what are the difference what are the differences there uh two differences one is planning and one is personality okay. so it's easy uh if you look at any business and you, you just draw a chart and you work on the left hand vertical axis and draw a line across and draw it down like it's a declining curve so that's what's called the decline curve of businesses and every business is on a decline curve. It mm -hmm. doesn't matter who you are, whether you're Rolls Royce or, or a corner shop, everybody has a decline curve. That's the curve that follows if you do nothing new, nothing different, nothing better. And then you have what's called the development side of the business. So the development side of the business starts off at the same point or the point where you decide to do something about it as that curve goes down and you start to do something different or better or more. Mm -hmm. Three aspects to that, more, better, different. And they're not a single line, they're lots of feathers because they are little projects. It's a new market, it's a new product, it's a new marketing idea, it's a new person coming into the business with different stuff. It's a, a merger or acquisition. They're all the development aspects of a business. Yeah. But unless you plan a business correctly and measure it correctly, you have no idea what's going on. If you ever tried driving down a motorway and closing your eyes for 10 seconds, who tried that? Don't do it, by the way. I don't have a case. <laughs> no. Don't do this at home. Um, but it's scary. Uh, you can't see what's going on. You're just relying on the fact that you're still going to be in the same road when you open your eyes in 10 seconds time. Mm -hmm. It's like that for a business. If you don't plan and measure, you are driving blind. Mm -hmm. And so that's the first one. The second one is the personality. And it's interesting how many entrepreneurs I've met in my time. And they said, oh, well, we're going to grow the business. So we're turning over a million. I said, why only a million? Well, it's a, a million's a lot, Phil. I said, no, it's not really. I went to see a business a while ago and they were turning 2.2 million. They said, we've been in business, how long have we been in business? 20 years, they said. I said, 20 years, you got the 2.2 million. Is that good? I said, that's rubbish. Mm. You're in the IT industry, for goodness sake. I did naught to six and a half in four years. Mm. And uh, so I said, no, that's not good at all. I said, but even at six and a half, the question is, why not 20? Why not 50? Why not 100? Because mm. the only thing stopping you from doing that is, is cash and people. So the cash is needed to work, work in capital, obviously, but the people, their attitudes, their learning, their connections, their networks, their abilities to think, they're the things that make the difference. Mm -hmm. So in any business, it's about planning and it's about people. And you'll often find the entrepreneurs have got glass ceilings because they think like an entrepreneur does, but once it gets big enough, it's not actually a glass ceiling in terms of ability, it's actually an interest actually. Because mm -hmm. once you get big enough, you have a management team in place. Uh, and I did that with my first business. I had a management team. The whole thing was humming and singing and dancing. The sales came in, they got delivered, the customers were happy. And I didn't have an awful lot to do with the day-to-day -day running at the time. So what did I do? I became disruptive, mm -hmm. like a small child. I thought, what can I do that's, that's adding on to this business? So I actually invented, with a, a guy I recruited, we wrote the world's first virtual reality city. Oh, wow. It was Derby City, online, on the internet. But here's the thing. 
It was in 1995 and you could access it on the internet with a 56K dial-up squawky modem. <laughs> and everybody looks at you and said, Phil, that's impossible. And we look back at it, Sean and I say, that was impossible, wasn't it? But we did it. Mm -hmm. And so that was hugely disruptive to my business. So my business didn't grow past the 6.6.7 million pounds because I was, I was somewhere else. I was doing something totally wacky with, a, with the virtual reality city. Um, lesson number two, if you're going to develop something brand new like that, don't do it 10 years ahead of when the customer's interested in talking to you about it. So <laughs> that was a project which didn't actually go anywhere because nobody was that interested at the time. So yeah. wow. but all, this was, all this was what we call BG before Google. Mm -hmm. So that was 10 years before Google was formed. We had an internet, sit we had an internet city and a virtual world that was better than Google Maps and Google Earth is today. Mm, wow isn't there a, there's a show on netflix isn't there at the minute um talking about the early days of google maps and how yeah google might not have um ethically sourced that <laughs> that uh, technology that's um, exactly right and and that if you if you actually watch that netflix well, i can't remember it's called now it's um i can't remember uh, but if you watch that what those german programmers were saying about what the internet was going to be used for was me Mm. I was evangelizing about the uses of the net, the use of technologies. We can do this and we'll be able to do that. And everyone was saying, don't think so, Phil. You know, why, why do you want internet on an airplane? You know, what, what's that all about? What's, why do you want internet when you're walking down the street? Mm. Um, don't forget, these were the heady days when the captains of industry uh, were turning around and saying, PCs. Well, I suppose there could be one in every business to run the accounts, but I can't see a reason for everything else. Mm. What do you want a PC at home for? That's such ridiculous. <laughs> and this is what people were saying in the early early 80s when PCs were first invented. Yeah, so. it's mind-boggling, isn't it? That's... It is. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what's quite clear from kind of just looking at your career history on LinkedIn um, is obviously you've started businesses and then you've exited businesses and you've started another one and then exited and... Um, What's the rationale for when you decide to exit a business? I have a character, a mindset, call it what you will, that drives me to make a difference to things. And it's when that difference becomes less obvious or, in fact, the difference that I make starts yeah. to decline. Um, so I have an attention span that says I will help a customer as a consultant by going in there, turning the wheels, making it better, training them up, handing it off, watching it for a few few days or a few weeks, my job's done. Mm -hmm. But please don't involve me with the management of that because I'll be bored with this in no time at all. It's not my character. I'm not good at it. Yeah. I am good at leading an entrepreneurial stuff and business turnarounds, stuff where there's a, something imperative going on and you've got my full attention. Mm -hmm. Ask me to fill reports out on a Friday afternoon and report that to my managing director and say, this is what's happening. This is the measurements in the business for this week, this month. And, and I'm tediously bored in no time at all. So, and I don't, I'm not worth employing at that point. Mm -hmm. So I always look at that for myself. I'm not worth keeping going with this. If I've got to the point where I've done enough in this business, pass it on to somebody else who would take it to different levels mm -hmm. or not, it's up to them. But I've done as much as I can in this sphere of interest. So I guess it's it's down again down to my personality, down to me as an individual. Yeah. So. Interesting. Um yeah, the other thing that seems to be apparent, um, I think it comes back to what you were talking about of like the entrepreneurial glass ceiling, where you know you'll grow your business to what you think you can do it, but not past that point. Um it doesn't seem like you have a glass ceiling, like just from what you've said and different things you've achieved. Is that fair to say about, or, you know? No, that's not right. Um, it's all relative because you know, you'll find some people who are able to grow 500,000 pound businesses, turnover, small little micro business, and they feel comfortable doing it. There's nothing wrong with it, by the way. Mm -hmm. They run a successful lifestyle business or, you know, they get something out of it. There are other people that can grow to 10 million and get a bit stuck at that point. There are other people who can do 50 million. But don't forget that implies all the structure and the reporting and the processes and all the things that are needed to yeah. drive a company of that size and there are some people who can drive you know multinational you know multi-billion pound turnover businesses yeah. arguably i'm not sure they drive anything at that point they drive the politics inside the organization but they have that ability and so along the way there is a development of a ceo there's actually I mean, humphrey developed the theory behind it uh, in terms of what the ceo should focus upon at different levels of the business 
Okay. Um, and so a CEO gets involved with the nitty gritty to start with, because that's what we do. So he or she will spend all their time doing the stuff. And then we put a management team in place and we manage the managers, but we still do a bit of stuff because we like to do it. And then we get a bit higher in that. And we, we do stuff with the management team and the people and we sort of miss not doing the stuff a bit and it becomes a bit of a, uh, I want to go back to it. Um, and then you release yourself into the networking side and the political influencing side. And ultimately you'll go and sit down with Jack Dorsey and, and, um, and the like and, uh, and, um, uh, and the people who head up you know, Zuckerberg and all those people and go and sit and have lunch with them. Mm. really does that interest me no not really mm. um but that's where I'll, I'll say well I want to stop there so my personality starts to think I don't want to go up that curve anymore I don't want to go it's not even up a curve along that road anymore yeah. um, so the role of the CEO will change as the company grows and the requirements of the business happen so I have a glass ceiling I'm not sure I'd like to put a revenue figure on it but it will be yeah. that position that says you now have nothing to do with a customer that's the sort of really moment for me um, and then so operating through a management team or through several layers of management where the customer and I never get to speak is a bit of an anathema to me. I don't like it. So I would need to, that would be my glass ceiling, I guess. So everybody's got one. Some, some are different to others. I won't say higher or lower because that's not true yeah. because you're a perfectly good business can exist at half a million, million pound turnover for, for a long time. And, and my hat goes off to them and people say, why don't you grow it? Well, you don't need to grow it. You don't need to grow a business, mm. but not growing a business does not mean you say you failed. Ah, uh, yeah. And that's really important because most people say, I'm going to grow my business. And they say, oh, I'm going to sell for a million. It's always a million. So <laughs> it's been a million for about 30 years when people tell this a million couldn't even get you to retirement these days. But <laughs> it's um, people always say this. They've got this fixed idea. I'm going to grow my business and sell it for a million. And that's, that's all very well, but they, they very rarely do. Mm. But there's nothing wrong with growing a business to you know, half a million, million pound turnover and making sufficient funds to feed you, your family, your aspirations, your ambitions. That's not a failure. That's mm. a success, but at a different level to those who want to build huge companies with all the risk and the pressure associated with it. I think that is such a total light bulb moment for, well, hopefully for a lot of people. <laughs> it has, certainly has been for me because I think there's this narrative that, yeah, business should just be a constant, like, upward trajectory. But, yeah, if the CEO of that business, like you say, doesn't align with the reality of, like, what a business up here <laughs> is going to look and feel like on a daily basis, then, of course, then the business won't grow there if the CEO actually, on some internal level, doesn't yeah. want it to <laughs> because they can't operate, then they don't want to operate up there. No. And like you say, that's not a failure. That's just, it's just your business reflecting the values of you, which is why I guess knowing yourself is so, so, so important. And you being, can know yourself, you have what we call a purpose. Yeah. And a purpose-driven business is, is a million times more powerful than one that operates commercially. The, the quest for growth, the narrative for growth is brought about through, through macroeconomics, mm. you know, our GDP. What's your, what's your general domestic product of a country? Oh, our GDP has risen by 1.3% this quarter. Fantastic, isn't it? You think, well, I've no idea what that means for me personally, but it sounds good. So, yeah, we're growing as an economy. But that what exactly does that mean, actually? And then, of course, you go back, and the, the, the thing that confuses me about GDP growth, by the way, and I'm not sure if anybody could throw any light on this, but when you grow at sort of 2% a year and you're growing, 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 suddenly you hit a problem and a bit of a recession happens and you drop by 3% a year and it's a, it's a disaster. <laughs> I mean, the world is ending. But you think, well, hang on a second. If we've grown at 2% a year for the last three years, and it's gone down by three. We're only going back 18 months. <laughs> it's all right then. It was fine. I, we all thought it was okay. But no, it's the whole disaster thing kicks off and the whole stock market tumbles because people get all nervous about it. <laughs> this whole quest for growth in financial terms and economic terms is a complete red herring. And it's got us into the financial messes that we find all around the world right now. Yeah, well, yeah, it's just fear mongering in the media, isn't it? It doesn't, it's not real. Um, but that is a very, that is a, <laughs> that is a very valid point. Um, and also like, I guess economic growth can happen not from like, like the businesses that were already established growing, but the, the starting of new businesses. Like I think 
we've seen in the, like the pandemic obviously so many people <laughs> started a business off the yeah. back of the pandemic um so yeah so okay um I think that's an interesting point to, to now ask this question um this is a question I always finish on um and like I told you I told you before we were recording that the theme of the conversation will help you answer this question <laughs> so hopefully that this is the case because I did promise it to you <laughs> hopefully I've not lo- let you down um but yeah I would love to know Philip based on obviously everything you've experienced in life uh, and business what is your millionaire secret just one <laughs> you can have more than one if you want can I have more than one okay um <laughs> Learn to play chess because the strategy of chess and how you move pieces around in your business world is critical. Hmm. Strategy side of your business is critical. Otherwise, you will never grow or you'll not be sustainable. And the second one is know your customer. And I mean, really know your customer, not just saying hello and buying them a lunch every six weeks. Go and know what's their pressures, what's their business pressures going on before you start to align a solution. And the third thing really is is get some emotional intelligence. Uh, and men in particular are, are terrible at this. Uh, they don't actually, I'm sure there are many, many ladies out there saying my husband or my partner never listens to me. Well, he doesn't because he doesn't actually understand what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's the, told, the whole thing is miscommunicated because men's way of communicating is different. It's more inhibited. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I say to all the men out there, go and find a bit of EQ, go and find a way of communicating more effectively. That means listening with your eyes. <laughs> right? That means truly listening to the words that are said. Words are incredibly powerful. Learn a bit of emotional intelligence because that will push things forward massively. It allows you to communicate, build rapport. It allows you to push messages across. It allows you to listen to feedback and be more effective as an individual. So whether you're a man or a woman out there, EQ, emotion, emotional intelligence, is absolutely critical, particularly in today's world, more so than any other decade I've lived in. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's a, a key one for me. So be strategic, find some EQ, uh, and listen to your customers. Mm. Oh. Well, yeah, I mean, as a, as a 29-year-old uh, investor and entrepreneur in the world of engineering, I can say that I really hope there are some men listening to this <laughs> from my sector who will uh, who will take that on because <laughs> it does sometimes feel like talking to a brick wall. <laughs> well, se- sectors are and those sectors you yeah. talked about are traditionalist sectors. They come from a long line of traditions and process and a, a male dominated environment. Usually, sometimes, um, and making changes is hard. Because most people are running an engineering premises, they trundle along thinking it's okay last year, it could be okay next year, we'll grow by 3%, be fine. Mm -hmm. But what they don't understand is we're in a thousand year decade. Yeah. And so much is changing. And if you don't change, you are going backwards. Mm. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for your time, wisdom, and yeah, just being so generous with your knowledge and your passion and... I had yeah I learned so much from this conversation every time I speak to you I feel like I come away with like three new principles that I know that will make me a better leader and and business owners take those on and this conversation has been no different (laughs) it's very kind of you (laughs) thank you so much for listening and please don't keep these millionaire secrets to yourself I actually have a favor to ask you Now we're in season two, I really want to get this podcast out in front of more people, which means pleasing the podcast algorithms. So starting from now, every week, I'll be selecting one person who leaves a five-star review or who shares this podcast with a friend to have a free business coaching session with me. If you would like to hear more from me or get to know me a bit more, um, you can connect with me on Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn at Beth and Jepson. Or you can join the Success Circle Network Facebook group. Or you could visit bethandjepson.com for a whole bunch of free resources for building a business that not only allows you to scale to seven figures, but that also allows you to scale your business and have time for the things that make you happy and healthy success without sacrifice is my ethos 
I am so thrilled to be recording podcasts again. So please get ready for some great episodes this season. And I will see you and speak to you all very soon.